Today we jump into chapter two in the textbook, which is about the history of uh, electronic media. And uh, this week and next week, so the next four lectures, we'll be talking about um, how the electronic media developed from the early days up to our current moment. And uh, it's a kind of a quick overview of historical development. But I also try to draw from that uh, certain, you know, I call them principles of electronic media. They're, uh, they're just generalizations that may or may not be true of all media at all times. But if you just look at it over the history like we're going to do over the next four classes, you see some general, general observations that we can make. So I just call them principles of electronic media. So these are not necessarily, these principles are not in the textbook written up as principles of electronic media. They're kind of observations that we can talk about and discuss in class uh, as, as we go along. So, you know, I'm using these PowerPoints and they're uh, published by the publisher of the textbook. So you want to get a hold of the textbook as, as soon as you can so you can read along and read the chapters as they come up. But for now, if you're still waiting for the textbook to arrive or whatever, these PowerPoints are very useful to you, I hope. So uh, there they are. They're up there. Um, so. We have an assignment due, I think, on September 6th. So I didn't talk about that last time because I thought, well, I'll wait until we're upstreaming. But um, you know, now is definitely the time to talk about it. I did kind of prep you on it. So this assignment, you'll find it here on the assignments page or in the modules. So, um, and what you want to do is, uh, um, when you write this little essay, it's a two-page essay, you want to submit it to me through Canvas. You don't have to print stuff out on paper. Uh, you have to submit it through, um, you're going to have a link down uh, at the bottom of the page. Um, we can look at that maybe at a, in, in an upcoming class when we have a little more time. Let's just talk about the assignment itself. So uh, I'd say there's three parts to this assignment, and in the write-up that I'm showing you, here's an example at the bottom. So uh, from here on down, the essay is called How I Use Media and How I Coped Without It. So this is you know, the kind of thing uh, I'm hoping that you will do for yourself and submit to me. It's a little bit longer than what's required of you, but that never bothers me if things go a little bit longer. So there's an example at the bottom. right? Now, taking it from the top, this assignment breaks down into three different pieces. The intent of the assignment is to get you aware of what media you use, how it is woven into your everyday life, and what it would feel like to remove it for a little bit of time. Okay, so that's three parts. So the first part, you know, what media do you use, I'd like you to do a little diary. And let's say, you do it over a total of three days. And it could be a little more, it could be a little less. But let's say, so let's say diary. And on your first day, let's say, which is a school day, you would basically just say, OK, what medium was I using? So was it TV? Was it you know, the web? Was it a game? Something like that. And what time? You know, so it could be a.m., could be p.m., could be night, and how long? Basically, so it would be like two hours or something like that. Second day, let's say, would be a weekend. So this weekend, like pick Saturday or pick Sunday or something. Again, what medium, what time, how long? And you'll have very different organization, depending on a school day where you're spending a lot of time in class, to the weekend, right? Where you're going to be doing, let's say you watch a sports game or something, so two hours, football, and you watch it on TV, something like that, whatever. What time? Okay, let's say afternoon. Okay, so this is, uh, and then let's say on the third day, whenever, and this wouldn't be a full day, this is the day that you give up 
a particular medium. So this is a day you say, okay, just to experiment, I'm gonna go without my phone for the next six hours, see how that is. Or I'm gonna go without TV, or I'm gonna go without my laptop for the next six hours. Just, so this would be the give up day, and it could be a weekday, it could be a weekend day, right? The main thing is that you have, you know, actually thought about it a little bit and written down a list of what you're using and how long you're using it for. Because hopefully you'll have some surprises here as to how much. Yeah. Or when it's like the day you have to give it up, does it have to be like the hardware or can it be like a specific app or a specific Oh, it could be a specific app. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that could, be, that could be fine. So give up, let's say, you know, give up Instagram or Give up TV altogether. Okay, so it's, it's your choice. Um, so that's the first part of this, and that's really the part that's the most time intensive, I think, is, you know, so maybe right now, you know, figure what day on the weekend are you going to try out just monitoring what school day, could be today, could be tomorrow, whatever. Just, you know, get a piece of paper in your notebook, and it's, again, what were you listening to or watching? What time was it? How long? That's about it, okay? So once you get the diary part down, the second part of this is to write up your analysis of what you discovered in your research. Do not submit your raw notes. So I don't need to get this. This is just, these are notes for you to take a look at and say things like, oh, I didn't know how long I spent actually on my phone every day adds up to like six hours or something like that. Or, oh, I didn't realize, you know, that um, you know, every morning, how much I depend on music to get me through my you know, muni ride to school or something like that. So these are very personal reflections, analysis that I want you to do. Um, the important thing is that you've done this, so you, you're actually looking at what you really, your, your actual kind of media habits, you know? Oh, Jesus, what's going on here? So, so some questions you might want to think about in your analysis, because your analysis is what you're turning in. Two pages, double spaced, there's no title page, there's no bibliography because you're not reading anything here, you're just working on off of your observations about what, what you did. So in your two pages, you might look at what media do you spend the most time with? And then also, what do you spend the most money on? They might be the same, they might be different. How do your media choices relate to your interests and personal identity? So by personal identity, I mean, are you a person who, like, um, first time you meet someone new at a party or in a class or something like that, you know, what do you put forward first? You know, I'm a gamer, or uh, I'm, I, I like, uh, you know, I like hip hop, or I like this band, or so on. So, you know, does, does the media that you consume play into that? How does your media usage compare or contrast with that of your classmates? So thinking about what other do, people do, you know, it's like, I don't ever look at social media. That's a big point of comparison, you know? So maybe, maybe you can make that. What conclusions can you draw about the media usage of your age group? So you might look at it and say, uh, you know, I actually don't have a TV at home and I spent zero hours this week watching TV. That's probably a little out of the ordinary for people of my age group, but very out of the ordinary for older people that spend a lot of time on TV. So, you know, again, there's no right or wrong here. These are, these are your reflections on, you know, your media use. And then finally, what was your experience of living without a particular medium? So remember on day three or whatever part that you dedicate to living without your favorite medium, I'd like you to think, what did it feel like to not have access to that app or to that technology for the time that you gave it up, okay? You don't have to do 24 hours. That could be tough, although some, you know, sometimes this type of assignment asks for even a whole week. When I was in university, they got us to do for a whole week, which was pretty brutal, but that was, you know, that was then, this is now. So give something up for a period of time and note down to yourself, well, how did that feel? Did you feel isolated? Did you feel anxious about not being uh, connected at that time, if it was that? Did you feel bored? Because usually you entertain yourself in a certain way. Uh, so on and so forth. What kinds of feelings came out of, or did you feel liberated? Do you feel like, oh, great, I don't have to deal with this anymore because I'm not on that medium, right? So, yeah. 
I kind of gave you three negatives and one positive, but there may be positives there too as to how you feel about giving up uh, medium. Okay, so that should fit into two pages. I think it should be easy to come up with enough to say, especially you don't have to answer every one of these questions, but it's an important one to think about how, and describe as best you can how it was living without that particular medium for a day. Okay, and so as I said, down here is an example that's maybe a little bit longer than two pages. It's maybe like two and a half or something. And that's okay if that happens to you. But, uh, you know, that's, you can read it over and uh, maybe it'll clarify a little more of what I'm asking for if that still needs clarification. So any questions about this? So yeah. the minimum you give up for six hours on the last day? Uh, it's not a minimum. If you can only manage two hours and you, you're, you know, it makes you feel what it would be like to have it gone for a whole day or something, then two hours is fine. It's up to you to decide how long you can forego it. And do try to pick, don't, you know, don't say in your essay, well, I decided to give up uh, radio because I actually never listened to radio and so it wouldn't be a bother. Yeah. That, we're, what we're trying to do is actually have you give up what you depend on the most so that you reflect on that dependence. What does that give you? And when you remove that from your life, how does that feel? So give up something important. But if you can only do it for a few hours, only give it up for a few hours. Does that make sense? OK, so this is due uh, next week on Thursday. So that's September 6th. And um, you, should, you should turn it in on, uh, on Canvas. So if we hit student view, and then we go to assignments, assignment would look like for you guys. You'd be pushing the big red button here, submit assignment, and then navigating on your computer to the file where you have stored your essay. Yep. Do you prefer like PDF? I prefer PDF, PDF or uh, Word. Okay. Um, you know, I can't handle pages because I don't have a uh, I don't have Word, I have Open Office, so I'll just make it. That's fine, just, yeah, export as a PDF. If anyone has any trouble with it, or if you're using Google Docs or something, as long as you export as a PDF, fantastic. Okay. Other questions? Okay. So hopefully this will be fun and informative for you, and uh, um, you'll learn a little more about your own media use. Because we spend a lot of time talking about what other people do with media, but it's great to start off thinking about what we do with media. And so here it is. OK, so I'll be reminding us each class, just asking for questions or filling in a little bit. Uh, and if you want to bring up any questions next time you come to class, you've thought about it. Great. Uh, cool. OK. So uh, we're going to dive into our slides here. Where are they? Uh, kinds of things. So there's a couple of extra readings up there if you're interested in what we talk about in class today. Um, there's uh, video Marconi versus Tesla and Orson Welles and the War of the Worlds, uh, which we'll be talking about briefly. So, and here's the lecture slides. For so this is chapter two. Like I said, it's all about history of uh, media use. And this is really, oh, I know. Look at like this. Like, the way the textbook is structured out, it has sort of then, which is always pretty long. So it's talking about the past, now, our current situation. And sometimes it'll talk about the future, like what's coming up. So when it says then, you know, we're back in the past. So early inventors and invention. First of all, just a shout out to what we did last week. Remember um, this model of one source and Many consumers, many audience members coming out, right? So we did this model of what we called mass media. And so what we're looking at in this class is the development of early mass media. And that would have been, at the very beginning, books and then newspapers, right? Because one publisher would publish a book, print it out, and sell it to many, many consumers. So that's what we mean by mass media. You know, you're a single source, 
putting out to many consumers. Uh, books were first, newspapers second. Those weren't electronic media, so we don't talk much about those. But pretty soon, we had electronic media coming out. And the first was the telegraph, um, which you know, was largely uh, what we would call a point-to-point -point communication, a point-to-point -point medium. So it wasn't mass because it was a lot of single individuals communicating with other individuals. Um, <clears throat> nonetheless, that was the first kind of electronic communication system. It ran on Morse code, right? And uh, it did create some pretty big social changes at the time. For instance, information would move much faster than it moved in the old days of uh, mass media, like for instance, newspapers. So if you were a business person and uh, you were, I don't know, selling commodities like flour or something like that, uh, in the old days, you would you know, look in the newspaper to see, oh, uh, uh, over in Chicago, flour is selling for a you know, uh, dollar a pound. Uh, here in New York, it's selling for a dollar five a pound. I could actually buy it in Chicago and bring it to New York and sell it and make a little profit. Uh, that kind of business was pretty limited because information didn't travel fast. But with a telegraph, someone could instantaneously let you know, oh yeah, flour, 98 cents here in Chicago. And I would you know, telegraph back, say, buy, 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 and send it to me. So you know, things like the, the instantaneousness of electrical communication actually you know, uh, changed society and brought up a lot of businesses that we'll you know, talk about later too. Changed stuff a lot. Um, telephones, of course, another point-to-point -point electrical communication, right? You pick up the phone, you call somebody else, you're basically one person talking to another. So not mass media, although, as you said, in the early days of telephony, uh, some folks did think that they could perhaps do something like uh, you know, uh, put the telephone in a recording studio and have someone sing or play into it and distribute that to everybody who had a telephone line. So there was that notion that even a telephone system could become this type of mass media operation. Never took off, maybe because of the bad quality of it. Uh, but people were more interested in using the phone on a point-to-point -point basis. But we get into the radio, which is the first of our you know, mass media, electronic mediums. And uh, we got a long list of uh, inventors here. Um, each of them added a part to what we know of today as you know, terrestrial radio. When I say terrestrial radio, that's radio that broadcasts over the air, over the, over the radio waves, right? And so, you know, all you need is a radio receiver and uh, uh, no wires necessary, unlike the telegraph. Uh, and people all through a particular area can pick up your signal, right? And so this was like a revolution in communication at that time. And yet still, we're not talking at a point where there was a commercial radio industry. When things start off, you just have a lot of tinkerers, a lot of, you know, basically garage inventors who are working out how radio would actually function. So uh, we have a bunch of important people who were involved here. Probably the most important person that we uh, is associated with the creation of radio was the Italian Guglielmo Marconi, um, who was probably um, not just an inventor of part of the radio, but also a promoter and a showman. So that's part of how he made his name as the inventor of radio. And, uh, and, and also, uh, um, you know, someone who had a vision for radio as being a really important communication device, which I don't think many people really recognized it back in the day. So we have a little bit of a documentary here from uh, Secret Life from the BBC where these, this is kind of an old television show uh, where um, a couple of these geeky characters uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, the basis of, of radio, like what it actually is. Let's see here. And can we get some volume? It's, it probably is. spark emits them. So hang on. Each of these sparks is... 
Video waves is actually very simple. Any electric spark emits them. Each of these sparks is sending out radio waves. You hear them on the radio as interference. That's why lightning makes radios crackle, and even the tiny spark inside a light switch is enough to produce a little pop. But without a radio set, though, it's not easy to detect these waves, and most scientists didn't believe they existed till just over 100 years ago. What finally convinced them was an experiment performed by the physicist Heinrich Hertz in 1887. It was first demonstrated in Britain by a scientist called Oliver Lodge here in the Royal Institution. Hertz used very big sparks created by a, a machine like this called an induction coil. Can you turn it on, Bill? This was connected to these metal plates with another spark gap in the middle and uh, this acted as a sort of aerial. This was Hertz's receiver. It's simply a loop of copper wire. Well, the big spark uh, creates radio waves with enough energy to make a tiny spark jump across the gap between these balls in the receiver when they're held very close together. So, um, hold these in position. OK, Bill. If you look carefully, you can just see the spark jumping across the gap. These sparks are so tiny that Hertz had to let his eyes get accustomed to the dark for 15 minutes and then watch the sparks through a magnifying glass. His apparatus only had a range of a few metres and he had no interest in finding any practical uses for it. The first person to use radio waves for signalling was Giuliano Marconi. Marconi had been a difficult child. His mother was a Jameson from the Irish whisky distillers who'd run away to Italy to be an opera singer and married an Italian landowner. She quickly got bored on his estate. There's not much going on here. I think we'll go for a little jaunt. The infant Marconi spent much of his childhood being dragged round Europe by his mother. Barcelona, or perhaps Boulogne. He showed little interest at school and constantly irritated his father with ridiculous scientific experiments. Shortly after failing to get into university, he happened to read an article about Hertz's work. He immediately started obsessively experimenting and had soon managed to transmit the signals over a mile. Still aged only 20, he arrived in England to try and sell his ideas. Marconi had found that fixing one side of the spark gap to a long vertical wire made a much better aerial than Hertz's. This was further improved by connecting the other side of the spark gap to Earth. Apart from that, the transmitter was basically the same as Hertz's. Any electrical spark will do. Here it's being provided by the ignition circuit of Rex's pickup truck. This primitive transmitter has a surprisingly long range. Marconi also used a much more sensitive receiver, called Coherer. This was based on a design by Oliver Lodge. This is my homemade version. It's just a tube of nickel filings. I made it by filing down a coin. You fix one end to the uh, aerial, another kite, uh, and the other end to the earth. And what happens is that when it detects the radio waves, its electrical resistance falls dramatically, so it acts as a sort of switch and turns on a circuit. The theory behind it's very complicated and wasn't worked out for until many years later, but it's quite simple to make it work. The only slightly complicated thing is that you have to have something to shake it to restore its high resistance at the end of each signal. 
So now if I signal to Rex, This is Marconi's original equipment that he brought to England with him. This is his transmitter with an induction coil like Hertz's and these balls that concentrated the energy of the spark. One end would have been connected to the aerial. This is his receiver. The aerial went on here. This is his coherer inside the glass tube. The filings are actually in the gap in the middle. And this is the device to tap it. Marconi would have been sending a, a combination of long pulses and short pulses, uh, sending messages in Morse code. Well, this original apparatus only had a range of about three miles, but Marconi gradually increased the sensitivity of his coherers and the size of his transmitters till he was sending messages hundreds of miles. The larger transmitters had much larger spark gaps, which got very noisy, so he had to take to putting them in enclosed boxes. Marconi's early systems had a big disadvantage. They couldn't be tuned. You can hear the signal from our spark transmitter all across the short, medium and long wave bands. The reason is that sparks create chaotic waves of all sorts of different wavelengths. What was needed was a more precise transmitter than a spark. This was the solution, the tuned circuit. It suddenly all starts to look like a proper radio, but the basic parts are still quite simple. There's a coil of wire here called an inductor and a series of overlapping metal plates here called a capacitor. The electricity whizzes backwards and forwards from one to the other, oscillating thousands of times a second. The valve acts as a sort of pump, keeping the whole thing going. You can see a picture of the radio waves this tuned circuit's transmitting on this oscilloscope that I've hooked up to a short aerial. If I hold it near the tuned circuit and switch on, you can see how regular the oscillations or waves that uh, it's transmitting are. Now if I compare this uh, with the spark machine, you can see just how chaotic its radio waves are. Once the tuned transmitter had been perfected, spark transmitters were quickly banned for polluting the airwaves. With the problem of interference solved, radio seemed so miraculous that it could be capable of almost anything. Early radios did still have one limitation, they couldn't transmit speech, only the simple pulses of Morse code. Morse code still used for messages on the shortwave band, and pulse codes are also used in, for radio controlled models. All right, so our guys continue on geeking out. Um, so, you know, some of that is, is maybe too technical for our type of course, but what it's trying to show us is basically that First, Maxwell theorized that around the Earth is a, a band of uh, uh, electromagnetic energy that can be disturbed by the sun. Uh, it can also be disturbed by us if we create, for instance, sparks, uh, as Heinrich Hertz did. Sparks are, you know, as you saw, a spark jumping from one surface to another. But um, what, what the point there was is Hertz said, look, if there's this electromagnetic energy surrounding all of us, it should be possible to disturb it in one place and pick that up in another place. And that's what Hertz's experiment, which they re-demonstrated for us, was designed to show. Create a spark over here, and if you pass it through you know, a couple of plates and stuff to focus it 10 feet away, another spark will pop. What's that proving? It's proving that a disturbance in the electromagnetic environment here will 
pop up over there. Hertz didn't think about communication or anything. All he wanted to demonstrate was the existence of this electromagnetic field and our ability to disturb it and have the disturbance kind of appear somewhere else. But Marconi learns about that and he says, oh, interesting, let me play with this. And then he thinks, wow, we could actually send signals this way. If we disturb it over here, someone over there can get the disturbance. And we already had this thing called Morse code, which worked great on the telegraph. So maybe if we disturb it like dun, 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 over here, we can get it picked up over there. Dun, 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 and all of a sudden we're using it as communication. And for Marconi's at that time, you know, one of the big deals was boats, you know, boats either in distress or boats coming in wanting to let people know on shore, like, what have I got in my boat so that everyone could show up and buy it as you appeared. Well, Marconi's invention was like, oh, yeah, so we could have like a telegraph with no wires. So we could send the information over the radio waves, which was his big thing. And so that's what he was trying to sell first in England. And then you saw those film clips of him, which were actually taken in New York when he sailed his big boat, the Electra, this yacht, which was full of radio gear. He sailed it up and down the Hudson River promoting his new invention, you know, which of course was an invention which was built on a lot of people's work. Uh, but he's the one who promoted it best. And so he comes away as a, uh, being, uh, you know, the founding father of radio, I guess, right? And so there is an essay online which, you know, if you're interested in, in uh, another, another inventor and, and scientist who was really interested in electromagnetics was uh, Tesla, right? And we all heard his name because of the car, but uh, Tesla didn't pursue this notion uniquely the way that Marconi did as a communications medium. But he too was really aware of the electromagnetic field and how electrical energy could actually, you know, be pulsed and sent through uh, the electromagnetic field rather than having to be plugged in or things like that. So Tesla was well aware of the phenomenon of radio waves too. He just didn't develop it into, you know, a business of communication the way that Marconi did. So we tend to remember Marconi as, you know, the founder of radio. Uh, as we just finished off, they mentioned it was only Morse code at the time, uh, but a fellow named Reginald Fessenden in the early 1900s figured out how to actually send an audio signal. So using the parts of, uh, of a telephone, uh, he was able to modulate that radio signal in such a way that when it was picked up in the other end, you could actually hear uh, um, you know, uh, he in fact played the violin and read part of the Bible or something on New Year's Eve and everyone was like, wow, what is this, right? <laughs> so that's it. And that was a very weak signal. People used to have to listen with like a little earplug and stuff. Uh, Lee DeForest, uh, who's a very famous American inventor, invented a ton of different things, um, learned how to amplify that signal. And uh, at that time, you know, around the early 1900s, you then get a, uh, a functioning radio system. So here's one of my principles, not in the textbook, but something to watch out for. The early stage of any medium is a cumulative process to which many people contribute. So although we say Marconi typically was the inventor of radio, as you can see, so many people contributed to it. And there are more, uh, more people that will, especially fellow named Edward Armstrong who contributed, who we'll get to in a second. But I think you find that, you know, Steve Jobs, you know, made the Apple computer. But, you know, what Jobs did was built on uh, a lot of other people inventing and, and contributing. So we should always look for a bunch of folks who are at the start of any medium. So radio starts to be a thing and an important thing, uh, especially with the sinking of the Titanic um, in 1910. And, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the distress calls that went out that actually saved a few people at that time uh, were widely publicized in the newspapers afterwards. People were so concerned, you know, that it was such a tragic story of the Titanic. Radio got mixed in there uh, because they had set out a distress call and some people were saved due to that. 
And this just demonstrates, you know, a growing consciousness of what radio can do, again, from ship to shore broadcast, not broadcasting, but ship to shore communication. Uh, so that the US Congress said, hey, this is important. Uh, at that time, there was like a whole bunch of enthusiasts who were involved. Uh, so if you got on any single frequency, it was like you might hear from someone in New Jersey, you might hear from someone in New York, you might hear from someone in Boston, and it would all be mixed up, and God knows what was going on. Uh, but Congress recognized, well, this could be really useful, but we've got to stop this chaos from going on. We've got to regulate this so that only, you know, we've got certain frequencies that you can tune to, which is just for emergencies, not for kids playing games, you know, in their, in their basement or stuff like that. So uh, they get involved and uh, they start um, uh, creating, uh, well, they, they had the Radio Act in 1912, which set aside certain frequencies for emergencies, and that will develop into what we have today as the FCC. Now, radio becoming a mass medium, this is an interesting turning point in the history of radio happening between 1910 and 1920 about. Notice it was all thinking point to point. Marconi himself was thinking, oh, this will be useful for boats to radio people on shore, point to point, right? And even on land, they were thinking, oh, we don't need to have telegraph cable across the country. We can use radio and we can send messages point to point like the telegraph industry, right? So somebody has the vision that's like, no, actually, with one transmitter, we could transmit something that not just one other party would be interested in receiving, but a whole bunch of other people would be interested in receiving. So it's the vision to say, well, this could be a mass medium, not just a point-to-point -point medium. And again, history is written by the winners. One of the most successful people in the history of radio was David Sarnoff, founder of RCA and NBC, the radio network. Um, and he wrote an early memo, uh, but it, that kind of brought together his thoughts on, hey, what if we use radio to pump music into people's houses? They already had uh, you know, a gramophone industry. They had a music industry where you could buy records and play them at home. But how convenient would it be if people bought a box, put it in their house, and then you could beam music into them, which he called the radio music box. So he thought of radio as you know, gonna, gonna send you entertainment that way. And there's the vision for a mass medium. And that caught on very quickly. Uh, so by the early 1920s, there is now a commercial radio uh, industry just getting off the ground with a lot of potential, with uh, particularly Sarnoff as one of the big shots involved. They've been through the First World War, uh, where a lot of improvements were made to the radio very, very fast. Because one thing about having a bunch of inventors involved, they start suing each other. No, radio's mine. No, radio's mine. So they're all suing each other, and things get slowed down as they, you know. World War I comes around, the government says, no, 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 radio's too important. We need this to coordinate our troops. Give us all the patents. So they take everything. And in that brief period of time, there's a big improvement to the technical technology of radio. And a lot of people are trained as radio operators who wouldn't necessarily have learned about it so fast. So after World War I, the technology is a lot better. The signal travels further, the tuning is better, you've got voice communication out there. So that's a big deal. After World War I, Marconi is kind of frozen out in his primary position. Because he's an Italian, the Americans do not want an Italian in charge of one of their most important new technologies. So he has to step back a little bit, and they create the RCA company, which uh, basically takes over the patents from Marconi. And Marconi's involved, but he can't be the head of that company because he's an American. And we still have that. When Rupert Murdoch, an Australian, wanted to found the Fox Network, he had to become an American in order to do that. So we still have that rule. It's like we can't let those you know, foreigners own our communication infrastructure. Kind of interesting. So after World War I, RCA basically takes over manufacturing and selling radios. Meanwhile, other companies divide up the rest of it. AT&T, the telephone company, 
takes the sales part of it, selling, selling the messaging that goes on, the, on this new system. Westinghouse deals with the big transmitters and stuff like that. So big corporations kind of carve up this business in collaboration with each other. And the number of radio stations just explodes. From 1921, you know, with only a few, to 1925, with over 500 radio stations in the US, right? That means in any big size city, a number of people are setting up radio stations and starting to just get into this business, you know? And that's going along with having inexpensive receivers that people can buy and set up in their home with the selling point that, hey, you just buy this thing, and then after that, you get music, you get, you know, entertainment, like comedies and dramas. You may even start getting some news, you know, and it's the latest thing. You know? So all of that, when quality, cost, convenient, meet user expectations, then an electronic medium will succeed in the marketplace. So that's another one of my, you know, general principles. If you look ahead, you know, to cell phone usage, for instance, you know, First cell phones weigh five pounds and they're gigantic and they cost you know, thousands of dollars. It, sooner or later when you manage to you know, get people onto a payment plan, shrink the phone, get all those things on it and people realize, whoa, look at all this thing, then boom, you've got a smartphone explosion. You've got a new, a new medium that really takes over in the marketplace. So that's something you can see operating at any time in uh, the history of electronic media. So that's another good general principle, I think. Now, Sarnoff has the vision for uh, a radio as a music box in the home, right? And Sarnoff's a very interesting character. We move so fast, we can't even really characterize these people. But, uh, you know, he's the son of Jewish immigrants, came up from nothing, uh, literally, like, just like, you know, hand to mouth living on the streets of New York. Um, He's incredibly ambitious, and he gets, he gets uh, you know, early contact with Marconi, realizes that this is going to be a huge thing, uh, gets involved in RCA from early on, even mythologizes himself, says that he was one of the operators who was working at the night the Titanic sank, and he was involved in this, you know, just like, a, he called himself the general later on, you know, when he was the president of NBC and stuff for like decades. So big self-promoter. So. He says, radio music box. But the thing is, how are we going to pay for this? You know, people buy the radio set, so that part is clear. RCA makes its money selling radio sets. But how do we pay for the content? You know, do we, do we make them subscribe? Like, they won't do that. They won't, they won't even buy those radios if they know that they have to pay monthly, like a buck a month or something. But someone has the vision, OK, and in fact, Sarnoff writes another newspaper article. You can see it in the New York Times. He says. What if we have three gigantic stations here in the United States that are so powerful that they put a signal out that anybody in the United States could get? And thereby, we get the very best talent and put them on those three stations, and then everyone will have something to listen to. And we don't need to have like performers in every city. We could put them all in one place, and with these three mega stations, we could you know, cover the whole United States. Does that sound familiar? What do you think those three mega stations became like a few years later? YouTube. YouTube? Well, that's currently now, right? But let's say like in 1930 something or other, what would the three mega stations, have you heard of like the big three, for instance, or the big four it became eventually? Nope, networks, networks. CBS, NBC, ABC, those are the first three radio and television networks in the country, right? So Sarnoff didn't know it at the time, but he's kind of predicting the emergence of networks, right? Because they couldn't quite make some stations that were powerful enough to cover the whole country, but they could make an interconnected network of stations that would play the same programming. The programming originates in New York. The stations are connected by long distance telephone lines. AT&T is still involved. And in each city, Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York City, 
those local stations play the exact same stuff that is played. You know, if you're on the CBS network or the NBC network, you play their content in each of those places. And you get that huge benefit of being able to centralize the talent and create programming. You know, you pay Bing Crosby a massive amount of money. He's a huge star, but you can feed your hundred radio stations across the nation with that program. So that makes you money, right? That's how, that's how it works. So in the early days, they call this chain broadcasting because all of those individual stations are chained together in a network. And that is a really brilliant concept. It's an early network. The stations are interconnected. And that way you can make content in one place, really good content, and distribute it throughout the network, right? And so that's what's, you know, early network broadcasting, they called it chain broadcasting, versus what was called toll broadcasting, which was some of these stations would sell you time, okay? Um, so you're in San Jose, you start a radio station, there's no network at the time, you are desperately trying to, you know, get every amateur performer in to be on your radio waves. But what you can do is you can sell somebody a chunk of time. Oh, okay, I'll give you a half hour. What do you want to do? Infomercial, basically, right, back in the day. So you get the early, early commercials are what they call toll broadcasting. And for instance, it was early on was a real estate developer who wanted to tell everybody about a new bunch of houses they'd built. They would buy some time on the radio and just get on there and talk about it. Hey, we've got these great 15 room houses on Long Island and it's awesome and stuff. So that's the start of commercials. And very soon, you know, again, between 1910 and 1920, all of this stuff comes into, you know, into focus. We're going to have a mass medium broadcasting entertainment and information to a bunch of people. We're going to centralize that. And we'll have a network of stations that play the same content, and we will support it by selling advertising. So basically a chain broadcasting model, but with toll broadcasting in the sense that we charge you a toll to put your commercials up there. The content is free. The commercials are paid for by you know, the companies that want to advertise. So this is, you know, what we call the, the network system. That's what emerges, and it, it's huge. We still have these networks today, right? NBC, the National Broadcasting Company, started by Sarnoff and other associates in 1926. That was the, the first network created to share content, and very soon followed by United Independent Broadcasters, which merged with Columbia Records and became the CBS system a year later. Another huge figure in broadcasting, William Paley, made, their family made their money in cigars, but he was interested in the communications business and he was at the head of CBS for decades. So for a long time you had NBC against CBS, two big networks, and of course those networks were not uh, owners of broadcast stations themselves, they gave the content away to stations all over the country that became what they called affiliate stations. They were, they were stations that contracted with the network to play the content. Yeah. Did you say UIB became before it became CS? Uh, UIB, it existed, but it kind of floundered in the first couple of years of, of operations. And so the Columbia Record Company, which, was, which they, they put out music records, uh, they absorbed UIB and together they became the CBS, Columbia Broadcasting System. And that's what Paley put together. These are, these are pretty sizable companies that um, are at that point that are coming together. So uh, uh, clearly this is an industry in the, you know, forming here. And uh, the need for more regulation comes up. Yeah. Uh, so the government gets involved again the Radio Act of 1912, which was mostly trying to protect emergency communications, wasn't up to regulating an industry in the offing. You know? So think about it. If you set up a radio station in your locality, uh, 
on a particular frequency. Uh, what's to stop somebody else from coming and down the block, setting up on the same frequency, but with a more powerful transmitter and basically drowning you out? How on earth could you start a business if that was a kind of a risk? And so the government gets in to regulate and license stations on particular frequencies to protect the interests of investors. Because otherwise the business can't go anywhere. If it's too risky, no one will invest. But if the government creates a kind of a level playing field where everyone has to have a license and they control it, then the industry can take off, all right? So another principle that we see is private industry doesn't like regulators. They don't want people messing with their business. But a certain amount of regulation is absolutely necessary for business to actually work. Otherwise, it's free for all. You know, so this is cleared up with the creation of the Federal Radio Commission. Notice they give licenses. They redesign the use of the spectrum. So in other words, you know, there are all those frequencies like 98.5, uh, 102.7. Those are radio frequencies. And um, the F, you know, currently the FCC deals with it. At that time, it was the FRC, the Radio Commission that said, OK, this is where you guys can broadcast. We give you a license. And they came up with this notion that uh, stations must operate in public interest, convenience, and necessity. Okay, And that's still with us today. The reason why we have a public radio industry is in part because Congress looked at radio broadcasting and said, no, you got to do something for the public here. you gotta, you got to give something as well as make money. Because the airwaves are like, you know, the land of this country. You know, uh, people can buy and sell it, but it is a public good at some point. You know, and so um, that was their that was their logic. Anyway, we, we can get into that on a, a later time. The FRC became the FCC in 1934, and we still have the FCC. And so when we talk about regulation, we'll talk about what the Federal Communications Commission actually is today. But I'm sure many people have heard about it. Have you, have you heard about the FCC in relation to any current issues right now in the last year? Ever heard of net neutrality? Other folks have heard. Miko's nodding. Some folks are nodding. And so this is something that the FCC would be um, intimately involved in, would be, for instance, deciding on the status of the internet. Should we think of the internet as like a telephone network, you know, which is uh, basically um, a certain type of business where, let's say, the telephone company provides the infrastructure, but they're not responsible for the content. But as what they call a common carrier, the telephone company is not allowed to discriminate against different users. Right? They're not supposed to be giving a great service to one bunch of people and then a bad service to another. They're a common carrier. They have a responsibility to, you know, in, in, the, in the view of, uh, uh, of the government, to provide an equal service to everybody. Versus if they're not a common carrier, if the internet is just a plain old business like cable, that means that anybody operating in that space is free to decide, no, no, we're going to have six tiers of uh, access, and we'll allow, you know, Disney and, uh, you know, CBS to get the best quality, but you, for your YouTube, you're going to get the shittiest quality. You know? and so that, that would be the kind of discrimination which would be allowed if net neutrality didn't exist. And so this is an ongoing discussion the FCC is involved with. But, so they are there to regulate communication services. In 1996, it was rewritten, but the Radio Act stood for about 30 years. It was regulating the radio industry. So there were a bunch of things, but you know, one thing that was there is, uh, and we'll come back to this, is political use of the airwaves. Uh, for a long time, the FCC enforced what they called a fairness doctrine, which the political candidates had to get equal time on the airwaves. So if you put five minutes of a conservative on, you had to immediately follow up with five minutes of a liberal. Right? Now, obviously, that doesn't exist anymore because you couldn't have Fox News or MSNBC or very partisan media like we have today. But for a long time, 
uh, they viewed that as a danger. And they enforced a fairness doctrine that went against that. So that's another interesting debate right now. You know, are we better off now that there is no fairness doctrine? The regulator said, no, say what you want. There's enough channels that um, that doesn't matter. Well, OK, we can talk about that again later on, too. There is some amazing product that came out of this in terms of content. You know, as the networks competing with each other try to get the most audience listening and stuff like that, you get the emergence of early radio variety shows, of course. So you had entertainers, singers. Um, you had celebrities from the movie industry who'd move over and be on the radio. You, you know, your Bing Crosby's and stuff. They're, they're big in motion pictures. They're also on the radio. Um, you had dramas. You had, uh, uh, and in fact, dramas that are still with us. You know, um, The Green Hornet, uh, uh, The Lone Ranger. Uh, some of these early old school radio uh, dramas ran for 20, 30 years, and they're still like cultural, you know, properties that come back in current form. You know, uh, one of the most famous things that you may have heard of or not is the War of the Worlds, which was a uh, radio broadcast, um, which shocked a lot of people who didn't understand that it was what they were listening to was drama. Uh, so on October 30th, 1938, they broadcast this drama about, you know, an alien invasion, basically. So uh, we can hear some of it. Affiliated stations present Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air in The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. <laughs> Gentlemen, the director of the Mercury Theater and star of these broadcasts, Orson Welles. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's, yet as mortal as his own. We know now that as human beings busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied. Perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. With infinite complacence, people went to and fro over the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, spinning fragment of solar driftwood. Aye, uh, aye, uh, solar driftwood. As we get further on into the broadcast, uh, they become kind of like a fake newscast, basically. So it starts off, we hear the usual opening of the show. But if you miss that, you kind of jump into the middle. And let's see if I just happen to land on something. Yellowish white. It's curious spectators now are pressing close to the object in spite of the efforts of it. Yeah. So at this point, um, the, uh, the radio broadcast uh, goes live to a field in New Jersey where some strange object has crash landed. Uh, there's a huge crater. There's a bunch of people gathered. And uh, of course, this is all pretense, but we don't know that. And uh, they're interviewing experts. And they're live from the scene, which of course is something that radio could do at, the day, at, at that time as well. You know, there's, there were radio reporters who would go out to events and connect remotely and, and broadcast that way. So uh, let's see if we hit a good section here. This is Carl Phillips again, out at the Wilmot Farm, Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Grover's Mill is the I'm town where it's 11 miles from Princeton in 10 minutes. Well, I hardly know where to begin. Thank for your word picture of a strange scene before my eyes, but something out of a modern Arabian night. Well, I just got here. I haven't had a chance to look around yet. I guess that's it. Yes, I guess that's the thing directly in front of me. Half buried in a vast pit. Must have struck with terrific force. The ground is covered with splinters of a tree. It must have struck on its way down. But I can see the object itself doesn't look very much like a meteor. At least not the meteors I've seen. It looks more like a huge cylinder. 
has a diameter of, um, um, what would you say, Professor Pearson? What's that? Uh, what would you say, uh, what's the diameter of this? About 30 yards. About 30 yards. The metal on the sheath is, well, I've never seen anything like it. The color is sort of yellowish white. It is curious. Spectators now are pressing close to the object in spite of the efforts of the police to keep them back. Uh, getting in front of my line of vision. Uh, 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 would you mind standing one side, please? While the police uh, pushing the crowd back. Here's Mr. Wilmot, owner of the farm here. He may have some interesting facts to add. Mr. Wilmot. Uh, would you please tell the radio audience as much as you remember of this rather unusual visitor that dropped in your backyard? Uh, step closer, please. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Wilmot. My position is the radio. Uh, closer and louder, please. Pardon me? Uh, louder, please, closer. Yes. <clears throat> I was listening to the radio and kind of drowsing. That professor fellow was talking about Mars, so I was half chosen. Half yes, yes, Mr. Wilmot, and uh, then what happened? Well, as I was saying, I was listening to the radio kind of halfway. Yes, Mr. Willett. And then you saw something. Not first off. I heard something. And what did you hear? A hissing sound like this. Uh, kind of like a Fourth of July rocket. Yes, then what? I turned my head out the window and would have sworn I was asleep and dreaming. Yes. I seen a kind of greenish streak and then zingo. Something smacked the ground. Knocked me clear out of my chair. Well, were you frightened, Mr. Willett? Well, I ain't quite sure. I reckon I was kind of riled. Well, thank you, Mr. Wilmot. Thank you very much. Yeah, you want me to talk no, that's quite on? all right. That's plenty. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard Mr. Wilmot, owner of the farm, where this thing has fallen. I wish I'd convey the atmosphere, the background of this fantastic scene. Hundreds of cars are parked in a field in back of us, and the police are trying to rope off the roadway leading into the farm, but it's no use. They're breaking right through. Car's headlights throw an enormous spotlight on the pit where the objects have buried. Now, some of the more daring stones now are venturing near the edge. Yeah, the silhouettes stand out against the metal sheet. <laughs> One man wants to touch the thing. He's having an argument with a policeman. Now, the policeman wins. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there's something I haven't mentioned in all this excitement, but it's becoming more distinct. Perhaps you've caught it already on your radio. Listen, please. Do you hear it? It's a curious humming sound that seems to come from inside the object. I'll uh, move the microphone nearer. Here. Now, we're not more than 25 feet away. Uh, can you hear it now? Uh, Professor Pearson? Yes, sir. Uh, can you tell us the meaning of that scraping noise inside the thing? Possibly the unequal cooling of its surface. I see. Do you still think it's a meteor, Professor? One thing. The uh, metal casing is definitely extraterrestrial. Uh, not found on this Earth. Friction with the Earth's atmosphere usually tears holes in a meteorite. This thing is smooth and you can see a cylindrical uh, just a shape. Minute. Something's happening. Ladies and gentlemen, this is terrific. This end of the thing is beginning to flake off. The top is beginning to rotate like a screw, and this thing must be hollow. Keep back there! Keep back there! Keep those men back! 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 Keep those the eyes, it might be a face, might be almost a oh, oh, heaven. Something wriggling out of the shadow like a gray snake. Now it's another one, and another one, and another one. They look like tentacles to me. But, oh yeah, I can see the thing's body now. It's large, it's large as a bear. So what is it about that they're doing that, that, makes, that would make an audience feel like this is real, really happening? What are they doing there that makes it feel real? Pardon? Acting? Yeah, they're doing, I think they do a decent job acting. Yeah, Nico? Uh, they do like some sound effects. Uh-huh. Uh, for whatever this would There's a scraping sound effect and stuff like that, yeah. They're interviewing people. Yeah, right, which is what you'd expect, right? On the spot. Uh -huh. I was going to say the same thing. Same thing, so they've got like experts, they've got the farmer, and you know, they even script the farmer so that he's kind of like, ah, oh, hurry up, say, tell him what you're doing, you know, it's just, they, they create that, you know, some of the usual things that a broadcaster would be trying to move the farmer along and stuff. Yeah, so, so there's a lot of stuff there that, that um, kind of sounds a little bit real. 
Uh, would you be fooled by something like that? Or can, can, or can, you, can, you, can you see how people of that time would be fooled into thinking that that was real? Yeah? Was that their intention or? No, actually, they, they were surprised that everyone was like tricked. Did they not do, give like full disclosure? Like... Well, in the beginning, you know, it starts out, you heard the beginning, it starts out as a show with the music and everything, and then this like, rah, 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 you know, I mean, it's clearly scripted, yeah. you know? But then at this point, pretty soon they've switched to like, you know, a kind of fake documentary style. So people, it seems like people who missed the first couple of minutes where it was clearly an episode of a show by the Mercury Theater, were tuning in and, and they didn't understand that it wasn't real. So there was a, a bit of panic with a lot of people phoning, you know, their switchboard saying like, is this real? What's happening? Oh my God. And people in the switchboard not knowing what was going on. And so some folks like, you know, running out of their house and packing the car and driving. Probably it's overstated as to the degree of panic that came out of this uh, uh, broadcast, but, um, it was, it was a big enough deal that uh, Orson Welles, who is the creator, actually had to apology, apologize, sorry, apologize. Uh, so yeah, in the, the next couple of days, he had, a, more intensely, he had a press conference. I simply don't know. You can see, he kind of looks really... No, no such thing as Martian. Well, it seems to me unlikely that... That uh, the people of an invasion from Mars would find ready acceptance. I was uh, frankly terribly shocked to learn that that uh, it did. So he's kind of like reeling. He's this brilliant young creative guy, right? And they did the show and stuff and. He's amazed that no one in the audience knew about the War of the Worlds, which was a famous sci-fi book that they were basing it on. He's amazed that anyone would turn, tune in and, and be fooled. But obviously, it created a pretty big outcry and, and you know, an awareness that, wow, this is a really powerful medium. And the audience, <laughs> maybe they can't follow along as well as we think they can. So we better be careful, I guess. You know? so, to end up with today with you know maybe one more uh, principle I guess or where was I here with my lecture, you know another thing that we see is any new medium comes out and people are not used to it and they tend to invest it with you know assumptions. Wow, this is new. This is great. This is going to be beneficial or this has you know more truth in it than other stuff. Audiences are kind of naive in the beginning. And, you know, as it says here, the particular qualities of electronic media. So the imagery, the sounds that we can hear, the immediacy, you know, where we are thinking that we're literally beside this crater in a small town and we're actually hearing it as it goes along. The intimacy, you know, hearing those people freak out, hearing the fear in voices and stuff change audience attitudes about events in person. So as this broadcasting thing takes off, people start to realize, wow, this is super influential. You know, uh, you can fool people into thinking something that's fake is real, and you can move people through, you know, imagery, immediacy, intimacy. You can move them, you can shock them, you can pull them up with you, and they may not think all that rationally when it happens. And that's something to consider as well. So when any new medium comes out, we need to also think that perhaps people are a little naive about it. And, uh, and, and um, it takes a while for us to get cynical. I remember when the internet came out, you know, and it was gonna change democracy and everybody was gonna be able to communicate and we'd have community online. And we got some of that, but look at what we also got, you know? So we're a good deal less naive about that medium than we were, let's say, in 1996 when it appeared, you know, 20 years ago. Cool. Well, that's it for today. So uh, next class we pick up, you know, with broadcasting after the Second World War. So the continuation of radio, the invention of television. We'll just keep on moving. Okay. So we'll see you on Thursday.